Happy Pride Month, everyone! Yay, Pride! Pride! <laughs> Wave your rainbow flags. Feeling a cult. Whatever everybody. color flag you cult want. Proud. Oh, sorry, I forget. <laughs> no, I know there's a lot of them. Yeah. Oh, everyone should check out the on Instagram the little cult confessions logo. Your there's... resident rainbow made it. <laughs> <laughs> resident rainbow. That's me. Both a dangling serpent and a resident yeah, rainbow. Only for this month, though. Nice. I get one, one extra thing. A rainbow dangle, if you will. Oh, I like that. Da dangling rainbow? I'm going to dangle. That's good. That's a cold open. That's solid. We're done now. We're what? out. What? We're, do We're done. Okay, We're done. We're done. We're done. Like reading rainbow is like dangling rainbow. <laughs> dangling rainbow. <laughs> Just add the whole episode you know. is the cold open. <laughs> <laughs> The Nazis were very publicly interested in psychological manipulation, and more privately concerned with occult manipulation. They took over Germany by fomenting racial hatred and manipulating the minds of its people to follow their political program, persuading them to commit or permit unspeakable acts. In their gradual conquest of Europe, they sought to break the spirit of the people who resisted them and bend the continent's will and purpose to their own nefarious devices. Opposing and defeating a nation possessed of both military might and capable of wielding immense psychological terror was not, in the minds of the Allied powers, purely a matter of meeting brute force with brute force. There was a mental and even a spiritual component to defeating the Nazis. The British occultist Dion Fortune understood this when she organized her Fraternity of the Inner Light to conduct what would come to be called the Magical Battle of Britain. Together, she and her fellow adepts worked to marshal the angels and sundry other supernatural forces arrayed on the inner planes to defend and embolden the psyches of the British people during the German Blitz, and to attack and dispel the dark cloud that had fallen over the German national consciousness personified by Adolf Hitler, invoking the mythological power of King Arthur, Merlin the Magician, and Jesus Christ himself. They helped to keep Britain out of German hands, despite the Nazis' brutal efforts to bring them to submission. Wow, that a, took a pretty sharp turn. We went from Happy Pride Month to Nazis. I don't Nazis. know. In the history of Pride, it's not too far off. If you think of uh, the the uh, gays as Britain and the non-gays as <laughs> Oh, I see, what, I see what you did there. But we could just think about the gays as gays and the Nazis as Nazis, because I believe they, they persecuted the gays. the gays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You are absolutely right about that. So, I think we're way on topic for Pride yeah, Month here are. in our yeah, bringing the Nazis back to attack them. I am oh. here for this. Our Nazi hunters. Our magical Nazi hunter, Dion Fortune. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, mention who we are. My name is Rob C. Thompson. For those of you joining us for the first time, I am the supreme hierophant of our secret order of alchemical actors and have my PhD in things occult. I'm... They're on the wall. We've seen them. Right, all of them. Yeah. I thought you were about to say your PhD is just in things. <laughs> in things. In Eventually, things. that's yeah. where this is going to... Yeah. To some extent, yeah. yeah. Uh, Olivia Litterall is our grand master of the order. Me, she, Grand Master. She is the practical occultist to my scholarly occultist. Practical is a word. We've got uh, our members of the order. First, uh, Jacob Wheatley, who we've heard from as our resident rainbow, but yeah, only for the month. Just for this month. Okay, we'll just let that sub in. Generally, mm -hmm. our Knight of the Dangling Serpent. <laughs> I think they both apply. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon Landers is our Instaquisitor. Hello. And Nick Ross is joining us because we're talking World War II, and he knows things about it. Hello. He does. He was showing us videos of things buzzing and missiles. And <laughs> things buzzing. So he also knows about bees. Carvingers of doom. Bees and Nazis. The Nazis utilized bees, <laughs> and we will also find out sea lions. Nick, did the Nazis utilize bees? Uh, I cannot deny or... <laughs> <laughs> We, the members oh, of the secret order of alchemical actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. All right, let's get to our three plugs for today. Plug, plug, plug! 
Wrong. First, we're going to talk about a couple of episodes that you could look at before, or look at, what should I say? Listen to. Mm. Oh, <laughs> look, look at them. Look with your ears. Yeah. <laughs> look beyond what you see. <laughs> uh, so these are in our back catalog, and they complement today's discussion. The first is our episode on Nazi occultism in season four, simply called The Nazi Occult. The second is actually from season two. Oh, wait, you have something to say about that? No, I just like straight into the point. Good right. branding. I'm messing yeah. around here. Uh, the second is from season two. That's our Lady Magic series, uh, and that is The Women of Wicca. Wicca. Lady Magic. There's a lot of dancing oh, oh. going on right now. I don't know, you said Lady Magic, and Jacob and I were feeling something. Okay. <laughs> At the, on the stage, I should say. Uh, okay, so uh, we discussed Dion Fortune as a forerunner of the neo pagan Wiccan movement. Uh, so we'll be talking about her meditation technique today, which some of you may recognize as sounding an awful lot like neo-pagan pathworking. Yeah, I know we have a lot of Wiccan listeners out there, so make that connection. Dion Fortune is is like the lady answer to Gerald Gardner. She was doing this stuff before Gerald Gardner became the man of Wicca. Before it was cool. Right. All right, let's talk about sources. Plug number two. Uh, Talking to the Gods by Susan Johnston Graff, The Magical Battle of Britain, edited by Gareth Knight, written, of course, by Dion Fortune herself. Those are her letters. Uh, the Training and Work of an Initiate by Dion Fortune, and The Romance of Arthur, edited by James Wilhelm. Uh, let's talk thirdly about Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, I just look at Olivia now because I know there's going to be a... I'm trying to mix it up, though. I feel like I always go for the same... That one yeah. felt a little, like, a little more solely. Yeah, oh, that's what, yeah. thank you. I was thank telling you. Olivia earlier, it's like, we gotta, like, meet up one day and, like, harmonize her songs. <laughs> so just, like, one day it's just gonna be, like... <laughs> We're gonna be yeah. a barbershop quartet away, by yeah. the next time you see we, us. Yeah. <laughs> if you randomly harmonize the Patreon riff yeah. there, that would We'll leave blow the podcast and start our own boy band. Oh. Uh, <laughs> with mostly women. <laughs> the first of our kind. Our band, mostly women. And Jacob. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Pride Month. You're enough it's man Pride for Month. all of us. Uh, so we want to thank Trey Chester, who just joined our family of patrons. Thank you, Trey. Welcome. Uh, welcome home welcome. to welcome. us. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. We're waiting at your house. Uh, and Surprise. Uh, we want to encourage you, uh, if, you, if you're thinking about it, you just can't pull the trigger to go ahead and pull that trigger. Give us that dollar a month. <laughs> Russian roulette. Like, it's no, it's like one of those oh. money guns. It's a dollar trigger. Like, oh. Because there is a whole lot of fun stuff that we've been posting. Olivia and I just did our uh, bonus feature for the Alistair Crowley episode in which we talk about Ignacio Timothy Trevich Lincoln. With your baby. With my baby, who helped the Nazis from China. Your baby? baby? No, no. no. <laughs> Trevich Lincoln. Oh, right, right. I'm my sad. baby is one year old. The Nazis have been gone for like, she's well on how many way. years, Nick? Like 70. Like 70 years. <laughs> Trebich Lincoln, uh, who became a Buddhist monk and assisted the Nazis in their uh, quest for global domination by failing to get to Tibet. Honestly, his story is crazy, and you should definitely listen. Yeah. <laughs> so for a dollar a month, you can hear not only that story, but bunches of other uh, bonus features and all kinds of nonsense. So hop on that Patreon. Let's close up the three plugs and get to our story for today. Plug, plug, plug. Is the reason we do it on both sides now? We gotta plug it back up. Ah. <laughs> Is that inappropriate? We'll e-rate it. It's alright. We'll e-rate this one. I feel like we've already said ass or something. <laughs> Let's start with Dion Fortune. Uh, we didn't do much of her biography in the last episode that we, we mentioned her, so I want to go ahead and, and give us a nice uh, overview of Dion Fortune, what she's all about. British lady, born Violet Mary Firth on the 6th of December, 1890. That was going to be my first question. Is that actually her name? No, no, no. Or is that the... the... She took the name actually from her family's motto because she's British and fancy and her family has a motto, Mm. uh, which is Dio non fortuna, which means God, comma, not fortune. Okay. You know, trusting God, not fortune. As a child, she had visions of her past life as, get ready for this, an Atlantean priestess. Oh, Whoa. hell yeah. yeah. I, I, I do want to point that. out that 1890, she's like right where, when this is like the end of Blavatsky's life when all of these Atlanta, 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 what am I saying? Atlanteans. Atlantis, Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta. The lost city of Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta. <laughs> Delta Your can't find it anymore. Gambino. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Gambino. Yeah. Uh Gambino. <laughs> Atlantis. Uh, So all these ideas are sort of bubbling to the surface as she's being born into the world. Or being brought back, anyway. 
She blossomed to full psychic mediumship with the onset of puberty and joined the Theosophical Society when her family moved to London. So now she's a Blavatskyan straight up. There's that puberty and women happening. And right. Stuff's going on. All that all harkens back, right, to the Lady Magic series. Yep. Check that Thank out. Thank you for saying that in a much better way uh, <laughs> than I just did. In a way that gets folks to listen to those yeah. earlier episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and she began her occult explorations now in earnest, because as Olivia pointed out, puberty brings on all that occulty stuff. You got to get on that shit. Right. <laughs> it's when girls go goth and start wearing pentagrams. Can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> so she claimed that she was magically attacked. By the warden of the Studley Agricultural College. Don't mess around with the Studley Agricultural College. Who is calling Been there, done that. <laughs> Hasn't ended well for me or them. <laughs> uh, so she had a job there, uh, and she was attacked by the warden, which led to a nervous breakdown and anxiety that was only fully relieved when she joined, get this, the Order of the Golden Dawn. There they Ooh. are. Yeah. So They're magically here. attacked. How? What? What does that entail? I guess she felt like there were occult forces being wielded against her to uh, drive her crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was making her sick. <laughs> Nick's having a hard time buying this, I think. I, I just thought she was assaulted by a wand or something. Oh. <laughs> oh he, he's buying it. He just saw it in more physical terms. <laughs> Harry Potter came. She studied psychoanalysis when it was still an up-and-coming practice and apprenticed with Theodore Moriarty, an occultist with a similar interest in psychology. She lived for a time in The Grange, which was a commune where she refined her practice under Moriarty's tutelage. She joined the Golden Dawn after the Order had fractured, choosing McGregor Mather's Alpha A Omega branch because she considered it the most orthodox. She studied with the Indian occultist B.P. Wadia, but the relationship was short-lived because, and we're not going to like this so much, she disagreed with him on British rule in India. Wadia wanted to see it end, and Fortune, British, did not. After a falling out... She psychically banished him from English soil. She Whoa. does not mess around. Wow. She really felt strongly about keeping India. That's like a lot of work. Under like the crown. if you're believing in the uh, in the occult, that's a lot of work to psychically banish someone from an entire country. Yeah, and a guy who knows his stuff. <laughs> Some stories tell that Fortune attended her former mentor Moriarty's funeral in 1923, where she asked his students to come and follow her in a new order, which I imagine is how my funeral will go with Olivia going around. <laughs> She's Join handing out me. flyers. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Between 1922 and 1927, she was involved in leadership roles in as many as five different occult groups, including an outer circle of the Golden Dawn and the Christian Mystic Lodge of the Theosophical Society. She pulled out of these groups, bringing along with her others to create the Fraternity of the Inner Light, later the Society of Inner Light, which she ran until she died of leukemia in December 1946. Wait, so oh. she she ran all of these different groups? She was but, in them. Oh, I thought you... Oh. Yeah, she but was it just never a became member. a conflict of interest between... All the groups were fine with her. Well, at this time in England, uh, I mean, I'm talking like decades now, people would be members of multiple things. Okay, You're like an yeah. enthusiast. Okay. Yeah. The Inner Light's base of operations was Glastonbury Tour in Somerset. The tour is in the middle of Somerset Meadows. That's so <laughs> fancy. <laughs> Everything British is kind of fancy to us because we're Americans and Even we're like not fancy. Fancy shoulder nut. <laughs> the tour. The tour. Uh, <laughs> Made All our British listeners are feeling super fancy now. Yeah. Um, made up of rocks <laughs> from the Jurassic... So the tour is made up of rocks from the Jurassic period, which are capped with iron-rich water that has kept them from eroding over time. The groundwater evaporates from the meadows, which produces a Fata Morgana around the rocks, making them appear to rise up out of the mist. That's kind of sick. That's what a Fata Morgana is. Oh. It's like an optical illusion. The tour was called Yinis Yurafalon. This is like old British. Or the Isle of Avalon, Old English. Believed by early Britons to be the site of the Arthurian legend. According to the legend, Avalon was where Arthur received Excalibur, rising from the waters in a clenched hand. Nobody really said whose hand it was. 
Just, Somebody's hand was It was crunched. a hand, yeah. Some people think it was the Lady of the Lake. It's also the place where the mystical Lady of the Lake brought him after he was critically wounded in his battle with Mordred at Camlan. There were stories of Arthur's and Guinevere's coffins being disinterred at Glastonbury, and it has also been listed as a possible hiding place for the Holy Grail. So, fancy place to do magic. Fortune considered herself part of an unholy trinity of occultists, revealing the esoteric secrets of their orders. So it was the fact that they were telling their secrets that made her unholy. The other two in her trinity were Israel Regardi, who began publishing the Golden Dawn's secret documents in 1938, and Aleister Crowley. Who just, I, I couldn't yes. even make a sound because I wanted to sing a love song, but we would have been copyrighted. It was completely it was silent. Just think about the pottery scene with... Ghost. You just had that moment. Yeah. In your I head. I love that picture of Alistair Crowley around you. <laughs> helping you create. So, <clears throat> Fortune revealed these secrets initially in her book, The Mystical Kabbalah and in the Inner Light, a publication of her Society of the Inner Light. She and Crowley carried on a warm correspondence with each other, and Fortune sent him her books and some money, because everyone who knew Crowley eventually ended up sending him money. Um, she... I, I want to get on that level. <laughs> <laughs> she shared his interest in sex magic. Her book showed an interest in Tantra, specifically theories of sexual polarity, and she may have even been interested in uniting her group with Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis, oh. famously concerned with sex magic. Her followers believed that she continued to lead them from the inner planes for ten years after her death. When the society decided to move on from Fortune's posthumous leadership, they burned her papers and photographs in an effort to exorcise her. Yeah, these people don't mess around. Oh, so she was like, nah, bitches, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> yes. And they were well, like, you got to go. It's been 10 years. Yeah, they let her hang for a decade. And then they, so that's what's actually going to happen when I die. Yeah, that's <laughs> We're going to give it like a little period yeah. of. <laughs> so you'll channel me to podcast me to the. <laughs> it's just going to be me listeners. just like. Talking to nothing in the middle of things, just rap, rap, shut up, shut up, rap. <laughs> Until finally, we you podcast the burning of apparently my driver's license. Uh, <laughs> for this reason, much of her career outside of the official book she assembled remains mysterious, as will happen to me because they burned all her papers. So we have it's difficult, other than her published work, to tell what she was all about. Mm -hmm. But she published a bunch of stuff, so that's the lesson. I need to publish all of my. I'm doing it. I'm doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> you, you tripped us up because we can't burn podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for the digital age. With war imminent, Fortune's Fraternity of the Inner Light found themselves unable to continue their regular meetings. So now we're in World War II, talking about Fortune beginning her magical battle. So she started to distribute her letters, her weekly letter, which had initially just been reserved for senior initiates, which are the equivalent of our alchemical officers, everybody in our crew who has received a title. She's like, I'm going to give this now to everyone. So, you know, the 15 other people mm. <laughs> who are alchemical <laughs> actors, right? So now everyone in Fortune's group of any kind, whether they're at the top or at the bottom of the rung, is getting these letters. Because it's hard to leave your house and travel around England with the Nazis bombing you all the time. That makes sense. That puts a little <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in these letters, she detailed the work of creating, developing, and maintaining a magical defense of the British Isles. Yo. <laughs> On the 1st of October, 1939, they gathered at 3 Queensborough Terrace in London, the site of the group's sanctuary, to begin conveying a message meant to inoculate the British group mind against the influence of demoralizing forces. Let's talk about group mind. Fortune says that all nations or races have a group soul and a group mind. The group soul is the equivalent of the subconscious feeding the conscious group mind. This is kind of what David Icke talks about, like, in right, but conspiracy less... people. No, I'm just saying. But she's fighting Nazis, and he's yeah. theorizing that the moon is hollow. 100%. You're correct. <laughs> Yet they can come together. Oh. The group, he can plagiarize her. But the group mind is more easily led about by propaganda and manipulation. So the group soul is in many ways more substantial. It's like when your friends talk you into doing something stupid, even though you know deep down it's a bad idea. The part of you that knows deep down is the group soul. The part of you getting talked into doing something stupid is the group mind. Oh. Now you understand all those yeah. stupid things you did. Shannon's mm. like... <laughs> <laughs> <It's not. laughs> 
Their impact on the group mind at this meeting is felt when they hear their sentiments repeated by, for example, the Archbishop of York in a radio address given as part of a national day of prayer that happens to coincide with their first meeting. So in other words, the conscious thoughts of the Archbishop of York are influenced by them playing magically with his subconscious projecting their messages out to the subconscious, and on the National Day of Prayer, he ends up expressing sentiments that they had been discussing in their group meeting. Oh, they were, like, instilling it yeah. into him. But it's all for good. Mm -hmm. They're not manipulating anybody. They're not reptilian or anything. Nice. They're not <laughs> Illuminati. We they are simply We don't like those guys. We don't talk about those. <laughs> Olivia talks about those guys. Uh, Rob doesn't talk about those guys. <laughs> But they're instilling this sort of strength in the British people and bolstering their psyches. It's a sort of a white light work oriented to good. So the work focuses on intuiting the symbols necessary to unfold the group's occult work on the inner planes. They discover a many-petaled rose and a cross. These are the first symbols they discover. And they see them, again, on the inner planes, which is like this, you know, subconscious slash magical space that they discover in their meditations. They see them inside a cavern, and that's the starting place for their exploration. So they're going to go to this imagined cavern, a cavern in their minds. Yeah. They also witness the shadows of the five masters who would be assisting their work from the inner plane. Sounds a little bit like Blavatsky now. There are secret masters hidden away. Fortune's masters do not exist on the earth plane, though, and that's different from Blavatsky's... Uh, folks. She calls them the elder brothers who come to her and her society in the light. They have been liberated by, from the cycle of birth and death and reside exclusively in the inner planes where they continue their spiritual evolution. There, they join Fortune and her followers in the work of projecting and bolstering Britain from this mystical cavern. So they're on the earth plane, projecting into this inner plane where the masters live. And that's where all these symbols are manifesting. So the masters are helping them from the inside, they're going from the outside in. For much of the time Fortune was attempting this occult work, Germany was actively attempting to invade and conquer Great Britain, most effectively with the Blitz air raids. These air raids literally brought the roof crumbling down over Fortune's head. Nick is nodding knowingly. Uh, anything to contribute about the air raids? Um, they just more or less focused on London, which was more civilian type. So yeah. Was... So they were trying to inflict damage on yeah. non-military targets. Yeah. Which makes them evil. Nazis. <laughs> Nazis. Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into that a little bit. Not a fan. Uh, we're going to take a moment for to not a fan of Nazis. <laughs> nope. You heard it Hot here. take. Hot take. <laughs> Hot take. <laughs> Sorry, listeners at home, but... <laughs> Olivia, can you help us get the brief history going here? Yep. Sean Priest into our little circle to do the brief history. Brief history. Welcome to the circle. Thank you. <laughs> A brief history of the Battle of Britain. After the invasion of France, Hitler attempted to broker a peace with Great Britain, but British Prime Minister Winston Churchill rejected him. Because, like, Nazis, right? Hitler planned Operation Sea Lion. The invasion of the island nation for July 1940, involving 90,000 German troops initially. How many sea lions were involved? Not enough. <laughs> yeah, I would say not enough. Not yeah, enough? Not enough. All right, Nick says not enough sea lions, so... <laughs> the Germans built bases and amassed resources along the French coast of the English Channel, but disagreed over strategy. Should they attack a variety of ports across the coast, or focus on narrow assaults? They decided on the narrow plan, but weeks had passed, and autumn storms which would make the channel impassable were fast approaching. For their part, the British had assembled a force of 500,000 for the Home Guard and constructed 2 million bomb shelters. But the final success of the invasion would hinge on air power. The German Luftwaffe under the command of Hermann Goering had 1,300 bombers and 1,200 fighter pilots. But what's the, what's the, the Luf, 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 the Luf, 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 Luf,
Hmm. All equally terrifying. <laughs> Just slightly different, but not, my, nope. not by much. The British were vastly outnumbered. His Majesty's Royal Air Force, commanded by Hugh Dowding, had only a thousand planes. But even if he had more planes, he only had 1,400 trained fighter pilots. No invasion materialized, as the Luftwaffe conducted periodic bombing raids on selected targets. The British managed to destroy 602 German aircraft, but then the Germans took the upper hand, killing 100 British fighter pilots and threatening the integrity of the military with strategic bombings. Then, Goering made a serious error. Believing that the Royal Air Force had been crippled, he redirected his pilots away from military targets and ordered the bombing of London in what would become to be called the Blitz, German for lightning. On September 7th, nearly 200 German bombers hit East London, followed by 250 bombers working by the light of the burning city into the night. But he was met by resistance from British planes who brought down 38 German planes, losing 28 themselves. Then, on September 15th, Goering sent 123 bombers with five fighter escorts across the channel. Fighting began at noon and lasted until the evening. When it was all over, the Germans had lost 60 aircraft and the British had only lost 26. Wow. It was clear that Hitler would not be able to establish dominance over the English Channel and- well, That's right. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> and by spring 1941, he gave up his plan for a British invasion. And that's a brief history of the Battle of Britain. Woo! They won! They right. won. That's the moral here? I'm pretty sure. They did it. Yay. Woo! The third week of October 1940, Fortune asked her followers outside of London to invoke the Inner Plane's help in protecting her London sanctuary. Then, on the 27th of October, those same followers received the following message from their leader. In our last letter, we asked our members and friends to invoke the protection of three Queensborough terrorists, and in this letter we have the ironical task of informing them that we have been bombed out of it, though without casualties. So it may be maintained that the invocation was at least a partial success, though your leader and her librarian looked like a couple of sweeps owing to a difference of opinion with the roof which fell in on them, but tactfully refrained from hitting them. Fortune relocated to number 21A Queensboro Terrace and returned to her work, tarping the original sanctuary and making arrangements to replace the roof. She's nice to be rich, don't get me wrong, but she's pretty hardcore. The Nazis bomb her house. She, she's like, okay, we'll just keep doing this next door. <laughs> I like it's not like we don't have another building we can go to. Yes. <laughs> Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> They were not expecting a rich British lady to be conducting a magical battle against Bane them. Bane of the Nazis, rich British ladies. <laughs> With multiple buildings. <laughs> yep. um, so from late autumn 1939 until the same season in 1942, Fortune and her followers worked diligently through a pair of images that they discovered together. The first image was very abstract, and the second was a bit more concrete, uh, a more concrete place for them, the more adept members of her circle, to go ahead and visit. Let's start with the concrete image, because it's a place and it's a bit easier to grasp. Okay, so it was called the Watchtower. Oh, that sounds important. <laughs> yeah, so again, this is all in the inner planes, right? This is all a sort of imagined space, but they're all imagining the same space and are able to s sort of psychically project themselves to this hmm. space. It's, the watchtower rises above the cavern we talked about a moment ago and can be accessed by first mentally visiting the, ca ta the cavern and then going up into the watchtower. In the watchtower, adepts gather to keep watch on the occult forces driving underneath the physical and psychological tides of war taking place on the surface. So you can like go there to see the psychic energies that are undergirding that sounds really cool. The whole thing. Yeah, they're sort of like rushing by you. It's a place for monitoring and gaining a better understanding of the spiritual progress of the war. Into the Chapel of the Graal, we can go to kneel in devotion, to find peace, and to receive spiritual illumination. But if we join in the vigil on the watchtower, we observe the workings of the invisible forces of both good and evil, and it is a position that exposes us to the risk of occult attack. Therefore, it is not for the inexperienced. So would they just reach this place through meditation? or Because I know some people used to take drugs to help them. Crowley was a big drug fan and Pascal Beverly Randolph, but for Fortune, it's a purely meditative act. You can push your mind into a place where you can go to this watchtower, this cavern. And everyone would just 
automatically see and go to the same watchtower? Like it's just the same? How is it the same to everyone? That's what I don't understand. You're asking a platonic question? Does it have to be Are you the invoking same? Plato here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what I'm just like, how... Uh, if you're invoking a neoplatonic ideal, then there is the perfect watchtower, or the correct watchtower, Yeah. that they can then visit, because it, it exists on this inner plane in an ideal state. Oh. So and you will all... all see more or less the exact same space and if you're it. legitimately connecting with the inner plane. And you can okay. like, interact with each other on this plane? or Yeah, I, I believe so. I, yeah. It's like going somewhere. You are Whoa. making that journey, yeah. I don't think they would do this simultaneously. They would mm -hmm. try as much as possible to work at the same time, but you know the exigencies of the war, you might not be able to. So you could visit mm -hmm. as you needed to when you were able to, to help build and construct this. Because it's also psychic energy that's putting this together and mm -hmm. holding it together. It's not unlike uh, the visualizations that we yeah. do in our group. Or yeah. 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 So we all go into this sort of creative space using the visualization to connect with that creative energy. We're seeing and experiencing different things, but they all pull together for the same project in the end, at the end. Here, mm -hmm. they're not even really seeing different things. They're seeing the same thing, but same idea. They're pulling together for the same project. Hmm. The more abstract and more significant image... So not the watchtower, but the second image that I talked about. Is of three colored rays, which join together as the three angles of a triangle. Pride Month. Like a color prism? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it's, it's a three colored triangle. There's the red ray of Mars, the blue ray of Jupiter, and the purple ray of, get ready for this, Master Jesus. <laughs> That's not the primary colors. Yeah. Nobody promised you the primary colors. I thought we were going it, there. It, it was no, going no. in that direction. That's, that's, but... Red, blue, and purple. That's purple not... for Matt. Well, purple is the color for Jesus Royalty. during certain... Well, that's what... They... Well, Nick is cracking up. <laughs> <laughs> Master Jesus is not a planet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see Mars, Jupiter, and then... <laughs> planet Jesus. <laughs> uh, it could be. We could... We, <laughs> I mean, who is it that thinks... Like, we should lobby NASA to name the next planet uh, after Jesus. Would this be Mormon. planet yeah. Jesus? <laughs> maybe, maybe we might be on... Yeah, Shannon's right. We might be on planet Jesus. These are the least occulty things I think we've ever said on this podcast. We're sounding like one of those podcasts that make fun of the occult because they love Jesus so much. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that's Bring not what this is? <laughs> <laughs> we both love Jesus and think he's cool with the occult. Okay. So the red ray is associated with occult, the occult symbol of the sword and comes to be identified with, any guesses? Our guy for the day? Oh, Arthur? King Arthur, yeah. The blue ray is associated with the scepter. Uh, scepter, scepter. Scepter. <laughs> the scepter. Like uh, and Dion Fortune ties this ray to... Merlin? Yeah. Oh, shit, I'm on a roll. There you go, you're on a roll. <laughs> Merlin, who in Nick's imagination is the guy who beats you with the wand during yeah. the magical battle. Uh, or as Arthur's cutting your head off. And the purple ray is associated with the cup, which I'll turn to you, Jacob, is associated with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because it's the Holy Grail. Yeah, no, I got okay, that one. You were on the spot there. You all wanted me to say Jesus. I didn't want <laughs> Just to. refused. I, it's Pride Month. This is the one time I don't have you to don't talk have about to. Jesus. <laughs> but you're going to want to. Oh, cool. Fortune <laughs> says that the Arthurian legendary connections that arise from this symbol are a lesser tradition that belongs inside the greater Rosicrucian tradition. Follow me now. They're back. This all gets a bit heady. We're going to try and make it as fun as possible by telling some stories, acting them out. Chronologically, the Rosicrucians didn't show up until long after the days of King Arthur. However, Rosicrucian, according to Fortune, is simply the name given to the Neoplatonic, Olivia, and alchemical schools of thought, also known as old school Western occultism. So Rosicrucian is just like our fun name for old school Western occultism. Another way to think of this is that Arthur is a variant of the quest for the Holy Grail, which is itself a variant of the alchemical quest for the elixir of life. Do you see? Yeah. They're all sort of connected together. This quest is wrapped up in the Neoplatonic idea that this world is, less, is a less perfect version of the more ideal spiritual world from which the world of matter has been derived. So we can go step to step to step to step from King Arthur 
all the way to this big neoplatonic theory but that's the big umbrella under which are these smaller umbrellas getting down to the grail and then down to arthur okay Fortune believes that Arthurian legend derives from pre-Christian Celtic sources, Celtic with a K, and subsequently adopted Christian themes into itself. These focus on the healing of the wounded king and are situated within the Queen Venus cult, or cult of women. Nice. Mm. Yeah. Hell yeah! Which Fortune associates with the folk traditions, or witch cult, that in turn inform the creation of Wicca. So this is how Fortune is really like a, a, a mother figure of Wicca. I don't, I don't know if she's fully given credit for this, especially in the postmodern Wiccan and witchcraft traditions, but she's kind of a major figure inspirationally. She believes that female woman power is essential to the magical battle of Britain. We're going to get there. So there are many medieval chroniclers of Arthurian legend, as you all know. Yeah, yeah. I, I know every one of them by name. From Go Monty Python to Chrétien du Toit <laughs> and Thomas Mallory. That musical they did. Yes. <laughs> Spam a lot? Is yes. that what you're talking about? <laughs> the movie really was the... Yeah, I know. But I subsequently. <laughs> so Fortune prefers Chrétien du Toit over people like Sir Thomas Mallory and presumably Monty Python, but they weren't around yet, <laughs> because he drew more closely on these pre-Christian originals. So, Chrétien du Trois was more connected with the pre-Christian origins of Arthur rather than the post-Christian stuff. So let's look at the themes of the Wounded King and the Cult of the Woman, each as their own thing. So we're going to guess what, my beautiful nerd listeners? We are going to go deep on Arthurian legend. <gasps> do we get to do Yay! accents while we talk? Oh, no. so I think we, we'll end up doing some accents. We won't, because that would no. be annoying. Oh. No, that's what but I the mean, actors I get to. Yeah. I'm going to start doing an accent for the rest oh. of it. Let's put us Just in the kidding. time machine and go way back. I'm with you, nerds. I'm also an Arthur nerd. I think he's super cool. I took he a is. class on him in college. He's awesome. It's, just, it's the whole the legends and all the knights. Super cool. Okay, and we got way distracted by Game of Thrones. We forgot about Arthur for a while. We're yeah. sorry as a OG. people. We need to go back yeah. to Arthur. Okay, let's start with the Wounded King. Chrétien du Trois, French, wrote... <laughs> I, never, I didn't say that. <laughs> so it's about British and French traditions, but the French actually wrote a lot of Arthurian stuff. They did a lot really? of that work. Yeah, it's <laughs> mostly the French. <laughs> so Chrétien du Trois wrote an incomplete poem about the legend of Sir Percival, who was the original knight believed to have discovered the Grail. So that's a fun fact. Hmm. Everyone thinks it's like some like famous knight, like Gawain or Lancelot, or even Arthur himself. But no, oh, it's Percival. Good old, old Percy. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Lancelot's son Galahad was substituted for Percival. But the good knight was allowed to remain in Galahad's company as he discovered the grail. So that's sort of a rewrite. But first, Percival's really the guy who, do, who do, gets the job done. So let's hear a bit of Dutois' tale of Sir Percival as interpreted by our actors. Squire. Yes, Percival. Do you remember the tale I told you? Of when I went off to become a knight? Yes, Percival. Do you remember I said that my mother fainted? Yes, Percival. And I just left her there, prostrate in the rotten garbage, composting by the cottage gate? I should probably go back to check on her. But it's been months, Percival. Nevertheless, off we go. And Percival set out to return to his mother, who he'd left face down on the ground months before. But on the... I know, rough, right? But he's a knight. He's got grails to find, things Stop. to do. I will get More. you later, mother. <laughs> on the way uh, back to see his mother, because he was like, oh, my mother, right? Whoops. He came across a king fishing in a boat on a river. The king was injured. This is the fisher king. Some story... <laughs> but, like, it is. This is what he's called. He's the fisher king. <laughs> So you're just it was crack- a simpler time, okay, so <laughs> If you were fishing and you were a king, you were- we called you the Fisher King. We didn't come up with all kinds of fancy names for you. Some stories place the wound in the thigh, others the groin. Ouch. But by all accounts, the king was unable to walk and so spent his time on the water fishing. When you're How does he get, does injured, he only stay in the boat? He never moves. Like his wheelchair. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's no, he gets out of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> he just can't go very far. I like thinking that he like injured just himself, like, well, this is my life now. I'm the water <laughs> man now. <laughs> <laughs> he was originally like the horse king or something. He was the horse king, but then he couldn't sit on the horse anymore. <laughs> I'm the, the fisher king horse. now. Come and feast with us, Percival. 
Perhaps before we feast, we should do something about that gash in your groin. What? This old thing? I hardly feel it. They carried you into the banquet hall moaning and thrashing. In ecstasy, lad. Not pain. You cried out, ah, the pain. What's this? A procession. We have it every night as part of our banqueting festivities. Bring forth the young man with the bleeding lance. Gruesome. Now the two boys with the candelabra. It was getting kind of dark in here. Now the lovely maid with the grail. Good evening, Percival. Do you have anything you'd like to ask me? Nope. Are you sure? Isn't there anything about this cup here that I'm holding? This beautiful grail that you'd like to ask me? Should I have prepared questions in advance? Maybe something to do with service or serving? Uh... Uh... I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Percival, you have failed. What? How? At what? What, what are we doing? Oh, the pain! Percival, you fool! You are supposed to ask who the Grail serves. What for? To heal the king. My mother always told me it's rude for a guest to ask about his host's grails. There are a variety of possible interpretations for this story. By failing to ask about the grail, Percival fails to discover its true identity and wanders ever afterwards seeking it again. In this moment, Percival is not bold enough to speak, and so the king remains cursed. I'd say without going too deeply into it that the story says something about how we must realize or discover our own inner healer our own inner Christ, in order to help others. Aww. Yeah? It's something that must be unlocked, though, through action. We have to take action. We can't wait to have that awakened within us. If we think we see the grail, our own path to truth and self-actualization, so that's what the grail is, your path to truth, Find your, your inner truth. Grail. Find your inner grail. <laughs> but if you see it, you need to ask about it or risk losing it forever. You need to be bold and reach out for the grail. Is that my wow. grail? Right. You gotta do that. Is that... Oh, I gotta get it! Why would people not ask about it? Because you're you're afraid of achieving your own greatness, Shannon. Now we're going into, like... Now, this now is we're becoming a self-help podcast, yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're after Joe Rogan's deal now. Because uh, you gotta join grail. MMA and, like, fight for your grail. You don't it's have like, to do that. It sounds like a lot of work. I don't want... You can keep the grail. Yeah, I, I think that this is true, though. I, I think that... People can be afraid of success, and we can be afraid of ourselves and of seeking the thing that gives us the most happiness. I mean, we're in, sure. I mean, we're, I'm gathered around with like artists, people who have chosen the major that their Maybe parents the did not want them <laughs> to pursue, yeah. theater majors. Um, and I am a theater major. So we know what it's like to choose the thing that's in everyone's honor of telling Pride you. Month. Right? Oh, choose this is perfect. Grail. Pride yeah. Month, this is perfect. Yeah. We're no getting matter what, or grail. No matter what coming full they circle. tell you, <laughs> choose your grail. I, our gay listeners, I think, probably can really identify with the social pressure to not... This just sounds like my early childhood. Yeah, what? to childhood. not be yourself, to mm -hmm. not grab hold of what gives yeah, you joy. Exactly. But do it! Don't let anyone stop you. Yeah. So you get it, Shannon? Oh, he gay. Yeah, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> your grail Didn't you ask gay. the question originally, like, what is that... What's that all about? Why oh, wouldn't I, I you grab like, why would, it? Okay, yes. yes, thank you. Well, I felt you did a very, lot of psychological unboxing there. I was like, I why is he calling very, me like, out right now? I through that. Yeah, hell <laughs> like, you, hell younger hell Jacob your was grail, like, guys. Hell yes. Your grail. <laughs> this is for you, younger Jacob. <laughs> Seeking these inner grails was clearly an important focus for Fortune and using her own inner Percival to bolster and heal the British people as a kind of occult hero. This was central to the way she understood herself during the Second World War. So we have to bear in mind about Fortune that she's also doing something a little outside the norm. She's an aristocratic British lady who commits her life to being a psychic occultist <laughs> who works in secret magical inner caves. This is all I want for my life to be, is everything you just said. A lot of people would, I mean, I know our listeners are special, but a lot of people do some eye-rolling about this, right? Outside of the occult circles. There's a lot of eye rolling about, oh, secret inner caves and stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, you're doing psychic magic meditation. So she, grabbing your grail, right, in the same idea, is about living for these things that other people. So she's in this exact same place as all these other examples. Theater majors, I mean, I imagine gay people in red to, like, states. Start crying. As yeah. an aristocratic oh woman, that's probably, I mean, she probably got a lot of shit. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's, that's a lot. Okay, now let's get to the second key feature of Arthurian legend, according to Fortune. 
That is, here we go, Olivia, you're going to love this. Oh, shit. The power of the feminine. The power of the feminine! Let's take a moment for one of Chrétien Dutrois' completed epic poems. So we finish this one, unlike the Percival story. Lancelot, comma, the knight of the cart. We first come across Sir Lancelot when Gawain finds him horseless and gives him a horse to ride. Aww. <laughs> what happened to your last horse, Sir Knight? I rode him to death. I happen to have a spare horse that you might ride, Sir Knight, if you'll help me in my quest. And what quest is that? I go in search of King Arthur's wife, Guinevere, who has been abducted by his terrible enemy, Melagant, the son of King Badamagu. Queen Guinevere abducted? I won't have it. Nay. Uh, easy on that horse! Later, Gawain catches up with Lancelot standing beside a horse's corpse. What happened to the horse I gave you, Sir Knight? I've rode him to death. Oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's just funny. I don't know why. Why are we laughing? Because he just got it. No, he doesn't. It's dead? I'm sad. This is how I cope. Just then, a dwarf rode by driving a cart. Carts, says de Troyes, were used for transporting murderers and traitors and highway robbers and people who lost a trial by combat. To look upon a man in a cart was... To, and I guess you didn't die, by the way, in the it trial by combat. It sounds like that biblical yeah. story. The Good Samaritan? Not Good Samaritan. Yeah, but just kind the of. There's biblical parallels always in the medieval <laughs> yeah. tales. Um, so to look upon a man in a cart is to look upon a man brought low, a man stripped of his titles and his honor. Lancelot still unnamed, asked the dwarf. Dwarf, in the name of God, tell me if you've seen my lady, the queen, pass by this way. <laughs> if you want to get into this cart I'm driving, by tomorrow you'll know what has become of the queen. <laughs> and the dwarf kept driving. Lancelot hesitated two steps, two steps, because of all that stuff about people looking at him as a guilty man stripped of his titles and his honors, did not want to get in the cart. Uh, and then Lancelot ran to jump in the cart, so he hesitated two steps. I need to emphasize that, because that's going to become important later. Gawain continued on horseback, traveling along behind. They soon arrived at a fortified town, where people marveled at the knight in the cart and asked questions like, Who's this guy in the cart? Probably a great big jerk, because he's riding in a cart. <laughs> That's what people say when I go by in my cart. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Who's that cart jerk? How Probably. dare he? <laughs> he must have lost a trial by combat. Yep. Uh, then the most beautiful girl in the town approached them with two slightly less hot, but still very hot girls okay. beside her. And they asked the dwarf why Lancelot was in the cart. But the dwarf... Just drove off. Okay, but like nosy though. <laughs> I know. Like mind your business. Well, they're super hot, so people just tell them things. The two of them are slightly, slightly less, less hot. hot. <laughs> and the dwarf just turns and walks away. <laughs> yeah, he's Bye. not having it. <laughs> not about it. After a night of feasting, they set up three beds. Here are two pretty good beds and a third very good bed. You can sleep in the pretty good beds, but you cannot sleep in the very good bed since you have not proved yourself worthy. Why the hell not? A knight who rides in a cart certainly cannot ask about a very good bed. I'm sleeping in the damn bed. And Lancelot got into the very good bed against orders. At midnight, a fiery lance pierced the bed. Lancelot dodged the lance, which only grazed his side, and extinguished the flames. Then he turned over and went back to sleep. Wait, what? Well, Lance, that's what I would do. He's used, Lancelot's used to lances. Fiery lances. He's like, oh. The next morning, that's bad. That's a bad joke. The next morning, they witnessed Queen Guinevere passing on the road from the window of the banquet hall high up above. My queen! No, Lancelot! If you throw yourself from that window, you'll be smashed into a thousand pieces below. Who cares? He's a knight who rides in a cart. Knights who ride in carts should want to die because they ride in carts. Knights in carts who sleep in fancy beds and don't get burned by fiery lances should die jumping out of windows. That's just what I think. After another series of bizarre events, Lancelot found himself fighting a battle with Maligant while the fair Guinevere watched from a tower far above. Look, Sir Lancelot, the queen watches. Wait, what are you doing? Turn back around! You've gotta face the men you're fighting! I cannot take my eyes from the queen! I will fight them behind my back! But that's stupid! Why don't you just fight them from the other side so you can look at the queen and kill them forwards? Gads, why did I not think of that? Maligant was in bad shape, and King Badamagu begged for his life. What, what was that? <laughs> King Badamagu. Finally, Maligant surrendered Guinevere to Lancelot, but she wouldn't accept him as her rescuer. 
So he went away, and a rumor spread that he died, and the queen mourned him, and he did try unsuccessfully to hang himself, and he mourned the queen. And then they were brought back together again at Badamagoo's castle. But why had Guinevere spurned the man who had so ardently pursued her? So if you didn't follow all the rest of that, that's really the only important question. Why did Guinevere spurn him when he spent all this time just trying to get to her? What does that mean? Spurned? Like, yeah. turn be away. Like, bye. Mm -hmm. hey, what do, you, what do the kids you. say? What do the kids say when they slide into your DMs? Ghosted. Then oh. you, oh, oh. ghosted. She and totally then you, ghosted him. Yeah, she, she yeah. By delaying for two steps to hop upon the cart that would bring you to your queen, you showed your unworthiness of me. I repent, dear lady. Forgive me my steps, for they were only two. Oh, but now I forgive you. Come and meet me at yonder window tonight, but let no one see you come a tree sting with your queen, for they would think evil of us. We can speak through the iron bars. There are no iron bars that can keep us apart, fair lady, if you would have me. Oh, I would, dear Lancelot, I would have you. Then tonight I will separate the bars so smoothly that no one will be aroused, except for you and me, of course. And they sexed and sexed. The knight of the cart shows Lancelot subjugating his masculine prerogative, his honor, his fighting skills, and his sleeping arrangements to a woman. The code of chivalry meant elevating women to the highest possible extent. Only when Lancelot seeks penance for his hesitation can he be redeemed in Guinevere's arms. And only Lancelot, who has no mission but to love Guinevere, is worthy of sexing her. For Arthur has other concerns being the king. The knight of the cart privileges the feminine in the extreme and is the true hero. Yeah, you gotta be all about the V or... Get out. Go home. That's right, ladies. This is... I'm playing this episode <laughs> Thanks, for Corinne as soon as she's old enough to bring a boyfriend home. Yeah. I mean, she's here as we're recording. Yes, she is. Maybe... Remember this. <laughs> <laughs> Christ power for Fortune is Grail power, and Grail power is female. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you think about the cup, right? Yes. The mm. cup is a feminine symbol because it's a vessel. Uh, and this is why she believes that an overly masculine Germany raging its way all over Europe, tearing the place up, needs a strong dose of Christianity. Grail power, woman power, because yeah. these all connect. So she's a Christian occultist in some way. Hmm. Fortune does not believe in using occult power to attack and destroy Germany's leaders because no one, she says, is inherently evil. Even Hitler. Aw, wow. <laughs> that must have. <laughs> that is like, that's some compassion, isn't it? <laughs> Hate is an evil thing in itself, whatever its provocation. And to call it righteous indignation does little to improve it. We look to see a regenerated Germany rise up in strength and greatness as well as goodwill and peace. On this great earth of ours, there is room for all if they will only cooperate. The Germans are suffering from an accumulation of evil thought forms that have gathered up over time in their group mind and are now leading them around in the form of Hitler. These go all the way back to the dawn of German history. Adolf Hitler tapped into these evil thought forms to manipulate the Germans' collective subconscious. But a national hero like Winston Churchill could do the same for more benevolent purposes for the British and Europe as a whole. Since the problem rests in the subconscious, the solution must be sought at a subconscious level using the imagination, which is the key to Fortune's meditative technique. Trying to persuade the Germans consciously of this would be a waste of time, since the group mind is poisoned to the point of insanity. For Fortune, the answer is to bring the power of Christ to bear on the internal spiritual condition of the Germans, and so disperse the evil forces haunting them. Fortune was both a Christian, as I mentioned, and a pagan mystic. She believed Jesus was one of the masters of the inner light, and that all world religions were equal from an occult perspective. Christ figured prominently in the discovery she made on the inner plane, related to countering Germany in her magical battle. Regular listeners will recall an important segment of Germany's occult roots was anti-Christian, and Hitler persecuted Christians. Nick's nodding along here. Persecuted a lot of people, and them being one of them. Yeah, they were just in the mix. Yeah. Namely, he persecuted the Catholics and the Jehovah's Witnesses. But Hitler also sought to recast Jesus as an Aryan rather than a Jew, 
Because it's awkward, right? <laughs> that underlying, like... <laughs> yeah. uh, that puts a damn... Yeah. Things. Complimenting Hitler's anti-Christianity was actual occultism being practiced by his second-in-command, Heinrich Himmler, with his obsession with the Knights of the Round Table, Castle at Wellsburg, and Totemkopf rings covered in runes. Himmler had his own round table and imagined his SS as an order of Teutonic Knights, not unlike Arthur's questing round table. That's so extra, though, to do that, like, now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Fortune had good reason to claim Arthur on behalf of the British. She was sort of reclaiming him. So, the question that lingers for us after all this, do you guys follow all that? Yeah. yeah. Any questions yeah. about the logic of this? No, the whole time, I guess, I mean, I, the reason why I said the David Icke thing is because to me, this is such a, like, better, like, I don't know why he took it and he made it way more complicated than and it is And kind of, like, me. just automatically dark. Like, this <laughs> oh, has, yeah. like, the capability of being good and bad that, mm -hmm. like... Yeah, it's a neutral force. Yeah, and I, that just, that aligns so much more with, like, a pagan, like, mindset that to me that, that makes just sense. Like, yeah. That's, there are these interplanes, and they, your your national interplane can go off the rails, and our world interplane can go off the rails, and right. but we can do psychic work to pull it back together. So, and so, imagination is the best way to do anything. Like and really, that. here it was a masculine anti-Christian off the rails. So mm -hmm. the remedy is a feminine Christian force. I, I'm really on board with her whole like thinking. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I love her. Yeah, yeah she's pretty cool. We're going to do a special a, a Patreon bonus is going to be about Fortune's, uh, one of her books, Rites of oh, the Initiate. Awesome. Cool. Okay, uh, so was the Magical Battle of Britain a success or was it an illusion? The British did win the war. Yeah. <gasps> Insert the you got me there meme. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. All right, uh, that's it for Dion Fortune. Let's get to our Order of Confessors, shall we? So, we've had a few. Actually, we've had, I've got three today, all on different platforms. I believe that is a few. Three yes, that is, is a, definite, few. <laughs> a definition of a few. Uh, we'll start with Cadu 1123. Much ado about Cadu. Ah, he says we are doing amazing. Ah. Finds us knowledgeable and fun. Ooh. It's a tough combination. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to the next one here. Thank you, Cadu. And uh, over on CastBox... We have a review from Mo Louv. Mo Louv. Yeah, Wait, just what? I'll let you play with that for a Mo minute, Louvre. Jacob. Mo Louv. I want to go Mo to the Louv. That was a stretch, but... <laughs> go Louv. Go Louv. Mo Louv. Uh, she fed us a bunch of stars. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated Mo Louv. And then Gino. <laughs> just Gino. Gino. This is, I think, just Gino's actual name. Ed Gino. I don't... <laughs> that's all i could think of for that so one gino uh came over to our facebook page because gino listens on google uh and he, he wanted to just let us know that there are people listening on google but cannot write reviews i, I don't believe it but i believe that they can't <laughs> write reviews i still don't think anyone is the google, google exists yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, I know we've got subscribers over there, and Gino actually talks to us on Instagram sometimes. So oh, does he? We know of Gino by other terms, yeah. Uh, uh, but he, of course, wanted to tell us that we're doing a great job. Of course. Uh, obviously. But, Duh. <laughs> but he, he can't say so on Google, so mm. Facebook is it. Okay, so this is the first, uh, this is kind of a first for us, and it kind of feels like, uh, I, I don't know, where we've arrived in a certain way. We have uh, some emails requesting corrections. Yeah, Yay. wow, we've done it. That means we yes. made it, kind of low-key, right? Yeah, it's a podcast that covers volumes and volumes of information and doesn't just sort of screw around. Corrections are, like, I've been waiting for these. People are listening to correct. Yeah. I'm delighted. Uh, so we've got two, one that I can uh, sort of address directly, the other one that I can't address directly because it's just a little bit too uh, complicated. But first we have Darren from, uh, he's British. One of our hey. British listeners. Oh, Jacob British. is already delighted by Darren. I love it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we mentioned one of our scholarly sources. Um, so I, I, I will. I do have to say, as a scholar, I use scholarly sources to back up all the things we say on the podcast. PhD. However, uh, that doesn't mean that these scholars have a full picture. And sometimes when we're looking at the broad picture, we miss the details. In this instance, we did say during our Livonian werewolf episode, the beginning of our warfare series, so we're right on topic here, that uh, there aren't any British werewolves. Or there aren't many of them. Oh. But there isn't a tradition of them. Yes. Because the wolves were eradicated from England. Is now, Darren a British werewolf? 
No. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I don't know. I can't actually speak for Darren here. He did not say whether or not he was a werewolf yeah, in his post. Mean. However, um, he would like us uh, to look into the Lincolnshire and Yorkshire werewolves. So even though there wasn't a broad tradition of werewolfism, uh, Darren's right to point out that there are certainly stories, folklore mm-hmm. and myths in particular areas of werewolves. So uh, I'm actually looking forward to doing a bit of research on these and maybe we'll bring them to bear on a future episode. American cool. werewolf in London? Nah, man. Lincolnshire werewolf in Yorkshire. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> TM. <laughs> Uh, Our next correction is uh, a bit bigger, uh, and and I can't get into it in depth here, uh, because it's from an episode quite a while ago, our our Maggie Fox episode. Oh, Oh, wow. Yeah. uh, So, um, Savannah is is actually lingering in the background here, and she'll be delighted when I say that we have listeners from the LDS Church. What? Are you serious? Yes, yes. Uh, so we want to give a shout out to Bryce, who wrote to us about our Maggie Fox episode. We did a sort of thumbnail sketch of Mormonism in that episode, which I just barely recall doing. Hmm. Uh, but it was part of our brief history. I went back and read. <laughs> I don't even remember. Yeah, talking it's, it's been about such a while. Uh, and so um, naturally, uh, the LDS perspective on Joseph Smith is going to differ from scholarly perspectives mm-hmm. on on Joseph Smith. Uh, but we also were sort of talking in very broad terms. I, I think that some of the details we could certainly work out. I believe Joseph Smith. Um, died in Carthage um, as the folks were trying to break into the jail to get him. Um, and I think we said he died in Nauvoo. I don't, I'm not sure if we were clear that people were trying to break into the jail, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but there's, a, there's several different things. And I'll probably just go back and do a little addendum on the episode that mentions the LDS Church's perspective. And, and this is what I want to say about this. A couple of things. If you're a believer in any of the traditions that we talk about, we know <laughs> and honor and respect your perspective on these things, and we don't want to take it away, and we don't actually want to dispute it in any way. Because, um, as Bryce actually points out in his message, and as we say on almost every episode, we cannot know the mind of God in any way, and fundamentalists who claim to from any tradition are generally the people we're arguing with. That's right, baby. Baby Karen has things to say. Always in the order of confessors, she suddenly has things to say. She's a confessor. She's a confessor. (laughs) Born a confessor. So... Origin stories are complicated. We're going to, when we do our Jesus of Nazareth episode, which is coming up. Uh, the ultimate Jesus. origin yeah. story. <laughs> we're, we're about to, as soon as, when we close up warfare, we're going to move into the healing, uh, our, our series on healing. We're going to talk about exorcism and demonology and Jesus and shamans mm-hmm. and all this sort of fun stuff. Um, but the Christian origin story is complicated uh, because there's a lot of motivation to paint the founder in a certain light. Yes, that's the whole premise, is raising him as the greater among us. Right. So scholars, I think, can take the opposite tactic and try to tear the founder down. Mm -hmm. So I actually don't think that either perspective is the best way to go. It's really somewhere in the middle. Um, So uh, that's to say, if you are a believer and we haven't represented your perspective in any episode, please write us. We will be happy to bring it in either to an order of confessors or uh, to an addendum. Because as an ethnographer and someone who's worked with believers of various stripes, I want to make that part of the conversation that we're having. And we certainly don't have any Mormons in the crowd here, but we can't have people from every I wish we did have a Mormon. (laughs) It would be delightful. Savannah? Convert already, Savannah. (laughs) You like the musical. <laughs> I have coming. no discipline. I cannot be a Mormon. <laughs> like, Mormons have so much discipline and control over their lives, and that is not me. I just can't do it. I know a lot about their religion. I find it very interesting, but yeah. All right, Olivia, bring us on home. We hereby adjourn and declare closed this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors till such a time as we get together and do it again. We were joined uh, today, our chemical actor team uh, was, uh, did did both of our scenes for us, and that was Brandon Walls, who has actually been sitting as our sound engineer. (laughs) He's been hiding in the background. (laughs) (laughs) In case I needed to hold the baby who uh, likes to grab the headphones off of my ears. Uh, We had John Cook doing uh, Lancelot and uh, Percival, did both of our nights. Uh, We had Brie Litterall as the girl couple times over and Sean Priest covering a bunch of characters for us so those those four 
characters brought us a bunch of characters. Savannah Verrett played the role of Dion Fortune, and joining us in the circle, we have uh, Shannon Landers, our Instaquisitor. Bye, guys. Jacob Wheatley, our rainbow dangling rainbow. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, happy Pride, everyone. Nick Ross, <laughs> World War II man. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> World War II man? Yeah, I, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> the next superhero from Marvel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cannot <laughs> wait. <laughs> Isn't that just Captain America? Pretty much. Uh, so, and, uh, but this guy just like knows about World War II. That's his superpower. He schools you in World War II. <laughs> take you down a couple notches. And he reenacts. Yeah. Yeah, that's World War II man. I can't wait to meet him. I mean, we have. We yeah, have him right, he's here, right here. He's sitting in And Olivia party. Literal, our grandmaster. Don't hang witches, because that happened today. Ah, uh, yes. You, you want to remind us of our yeah, history? Today's the day uh, the Salem Witch Trials started, because uh, Bridget Bishop was hung. So I feel like that kind of ties into this episode a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Our mother of uh, modern witchcraft. Yeah. Stop yeah. burning them, man. Stop burning them. I guess them. we did. Yeah, that's good. That. I'm glad we did that. Yeah. So, uh, me, my name is Rob Thompson. My baby has had enough and she wants to get out of here, so I gotta close this on up. I promise you, our next episode will be about something just as cool as this one Cold War Psychic Spies. <gasps> Join us next time for that discussion. Thank you all again for joining us. We love you. Have a great two weeks. We'll see you on the other side. Bye, guys. Happy birthday.